In 1923, scientists unearthed a skull in the deserts of Mongolia so massive it measured over 83 centimeters. That single fossil and nothing else is all we have ever found of Andrew Zarkas. From just this one piece, researchers once estimated it to be among the largest terrestrial mammalian carnivores, though later work significantly revised those guesses. What can one skull possibly tell us about an animal's body diet and life along the ancient Tethys Sea and the skull keeps flipping the story we thought we knew? To begin answering that, we have to examine the only evidence we've got. Our only tangible link to Andrew Zarkas is a single massive skull over 80 centimetres, over 31 and a half inches long, without a single accompanying bone from the rest of its body. It was unearthed in the Irdin Manha Formation of Mongolia during a 1923 expedition. And that very specimen, catalogued as AMNH20135, is now on display at the American Museum of Natural History. This solitary find stands as one of paleontology's most perplexing cases because every idea about the animal's size, proportions and lifestyle has to be drawn from just this one piece. Working from a lone skull presents a huge challenge. Without limb bones or a spine, there's nothing to directly indicate posture, gait or body mass distribution. As a result, reconstructions vary widely. Some depict it as bear like others, closer to a heavily built oversized pig. And each interpretation starts with the skull's most conspicuous traits. About 60% of the skull is snout, giving it a long, low profile that clearly shaped scientists' early ideas about feeding. The skull shows broad zygomatic arches, which would have supported large masseter muscles for chewing. Yet it also has a relatively small sagittal crest and a low flattened glenoid fossa at the jaw joint. That combination is a mixed signal. It suggests considerable strength in one set of jaw muscles, but lacks the tall crest and tight articulation typically seen in mammals with an extreme shearing bite. Trying to predict the whole animal from these features is a bit like reconstructing a missing sports car from only its hood and grill. You might infer something about speed or power from the contours, but the chassis wheels and interior remain a mystery. When it was first described, its tooth and skull structure led researchers to classify Andrew Zarkas as a giant mesonychid hoofed predators with elongated skulls. This placed it in the role of a massive land stalking carnivore and early models and illustrations reflected that image long limbed, muscular and specialized for pursuit hunting. Subsequent phylogenetic work shifted that view. Detailed comparisons moved Andrusarchus out of Mesonychia and placed it nearer to Entelodonts and the hippo whale clade. This forced a reconsideration of its build, suggesting it might have been more robust and compact, similar in stance to other large artiodactyls with a broader range of uh, feeding behaviours. For paleo artists, this change meant scrapping earlier predator-centric versions and developing reconstructions with shorter limbs, heavier torsos and a head proportioned for powerful but versatile chewing rather than solely for killing prey. In this way, the skull is more than a clue to appearance. It's also the primary evidence for interpreting how the animal fed. And it's the teeth embedded in that skull that offer the clearest hints about what and how it actually ate. For an animal so often imagined as a fearsome land predator, the teeth of Andrew Zarkas tell a more complicated story. In most large meat-eating mammals, some of the back teeth evolve into carnassials, specialized blades for slicing flesh with speed and efficiency. Andrew's Arcus had none of these. Instead, its jaws carried a complete generalized set of teeth, three incisors, one canine, four premolars, and three molars on each side. A formula common in many mammals, but unusual in top predators. It lacks true carnassial blades and instead has broad, worn, often wrinkled molars, more like the bone crushing intelodonts than the precision cutters of a cat or dog. These tooth surfaces are consistent with gyrophagy, the ability to crush and process hard items. 
The cheek teeth in particular resemble those of animals adapted to cracking open bone splitting shells or grinding through cartilage. This architecture points toward a feeding approach that emphasized mechanical force and durability over efficient slicing. At the front of the mouth, one feature stands out in large second incisors positioned between the smaller first incisors and the long canines. These enlarged teeth known from the size of their sockets, suggest a role in gripping or manipulating items, not as a unique killing weapon. Their placement hints at an ability to handle food with precision and control, whether pulling apart a carcass or working loose embedded material, but without committing to a single specialized function. Taken together, the dentition is not a finely tuned set of knives, but more a heavy duty multi-purpose toolkit built for crushing, prying, and processing tough or armored food. Such a toolkit would make sense only if those challenges arose often enough in the animal's daily life to favor this combination of traits. Thick bones of land mammals, the hard shells of turtles, or even the dense armor of certain fish could all fit into that category of difficult but valuable resources. Many of the preserved molars show heavy wear consistent with crushing use patterns we tend to see in animals that habitually work on dense or abrasive foods. It would be difficult to produce such wear from a diet made up mostly of soft tissue. This further undermines the idea of Andrew Zarkus as a pure pursuit predator and instead opens the door to a broader, more opportunistic lifestyle one that might include scavenging, bone cracking, and exploiting whatever high calorie items were available. That kind of versatility would be particularly advantageous in certain settings, especially places where wind tide and terrain continually delivered unpredictable meals. To better understand why this feeding strategy may have been favored, we need to step back and picture the environment where Andrews Arcus lived an environment shaped not by the open plains of popular illustrations, but by a very different kind of edge. Around 40 million years ago, the mid-Eocene world, along what's now Inner Mongolia, looked very different. Warm, humid air hung over a patchwork of sandbars, tidal flats, estuarine channels, and tangled coastal vegetation where the land met the northern reaches of the ancient Tethys Sea. The holotype came from the Eirdin Manha formation, a deposit interpreted as coastal to estuarine in the mid Eocene, so the shoreline hypothesis is consistent with the site. Still, with only a skull, we can't say for certain that Andrews Arcus was restricted to the coast, only that such a habitat is plausible. That mix of sandy stretches and bordering forests would have supported both terrestrial and shoreline life creating an unusually broad menu of possible food sources. Beached marine carrion, anything from large fish to small marine mammals, could have been exploited with little effort while tidal changes exposed hard-shelled prey like turtles or shellfish. In nearby woodlands and wetlands, other resources would have been available from small vertebrates to plant matter. For a large, flexible feeder, such a location could offer a dependable cycle of opportunities. The feeding apparatus we see in the skull fits with this potential. A long snout and sturdy jaws combined with broad, crushing cheek teeth could have handled everything from turtle shells to dense bone. Buried invertebrates might have been dug out of wet sand while decomposing carcasses along the tide line provided high calorie meals without the risks of chasing live prey. This interpretation doesn't paint Andrews Arcus as a specialized hunter of one niche, but as an animal able to take advantage of whatever resources were present. Think of modern coastal opportunists like brown bears at Salmon Runs. They combine hunting, scavenging, and foraging as the season and tides change. Such adaptability doesn't make them identical to Andrew Zarkus, but it does illustrate how a large mammal can thrive by drawing from several food sources in a dynamic environment. Choosing not to rely on a single feeding strategy would have been particularly useful if one resource was abundant only during part of the year. That adaptability could help explain short-term survival in a changing environment 
but it would not guarantee protection from long-term climate shifts. Over geological timescales, warming or cooling trends, altered sea levels and changing coastlines could eliminate key feeding grounds. History is full of large mammals that seemed well equipped for their surroundings, yet vanished when those surroundings shifted. Even so, the shoreline setting of the Irdin Manha find ties the anatomy of Andrew Zarkas to a plausible ecological role. It's a reminder that one fossil can do more than show us an animal's form. It can anchor it in a place and time, allowing us to explore how and where it might have lived. And in this case, that single skull has sparked a century of questions about a creature we still barely understand. The extinction of Andrews Arcus is believed to be linked to significant global climate change at the end of the Eocene epoch, approximately 34 million years ago. This period known to geologists as the Eocene-Oligocene transition marked a critical turning point in Earth's history as the global climate shifted dramatically from warm and humid to cooler and drier. This change had a profound impact on ecosystems and led to the extinction of many animal species, including Andrews Arcus. The primary cause of its disappearance was a severe decline in its habitat and food sources. Given its powerful omnivorous or scavenging capabilities inferred from its dental structure, Andrews Arcus likely relied on abundant resources in coastal and forested environments. However, as the climate became more arid, these forests receded, giving way to vast grasslands. This not only shrank the habitat of Andrews Arcus, but also reduced the population of primitive ungulates, which were its potential prey or a source of carrion. Furthermore, Andrews Arcus faced increasing competition from new predators. Towards the end of the Eocene and the beginning of the Oligocene, more modern predatory groups such as canids, dog family and felids, cat family, began to thrive. With their superior agility, intelligence and more efficient hunting abilities, they created intense competition for food resources, especially as resources became scarce. The combination of habitat loss, a decline in food supply and fierce competition created an ecological trap from which Andrews Arcus could not escape. As a large animal, it required a massive amount of food to survive. And when the food chain was disrupted, it was one of the most vulnerable species. The extinction of Andrews Arcus was not just the disappearance of one species, but it also marked the end of an era and the rise of more modern mammals, paving the way for the development of the ecosystems we see today. From the 83 CAM 32 and a half inch skull and its 3.1.4.3 teeth, we can say mixed cranial signals about bite strength. Molars point to crushing and durophagy. Later phylogenetic work ties Andrews Arcus nearer Intelodonts and the hippo whale group. Those points give us valuable but limited insight into an animal still known only from one part of its anatomy. Another postcranial bone could significantly refine or overturn current reconstructions. Which vision do you prefer, wolf style, hunter or shore scraper, scavenger? Tell us in the comments why. For now, Andrews Arcus remains a one skull mystery that keeps paleontologists debating and that is exactly why we keep digging.